Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to our talk about diversity matters. And when we talk about diversity, we know this is not a problem which is solely a problem for the IT industry. This is a problem everywhere. Just look at the US elections and you know the problem is literally everywhere. However, we can't change the whole world in one go. But we can change our world. And that's what we'd like to talk with you about. I remember the very first time when I went to a conference. It was intimidating. It was so many impressions, so many people, and I felt very alone and very visible as a woman at that conference. And I went to quite a lot of conferences since, and, and some of them I, I actually approach women at conferences, asking them, you know, how are you experiencing it? Can I introduce you to some people? And at one of those conferences, I went up to a lady standing outside, and I asked her, how are you doing? How are you enjoying it? And she looked at me and said, thank you. You are the first person in two days to talk with me. That is basically why we need more diversity. The whole fact that people can feel so uncomfortable, so out of place, is not something which is healthy for our industry. So, who likes to have fun with other people? <laughs> <laughs> who has sometimes felt alone? Yeah. Well, I grew up in a small village, and the thing with growing up in a small village is everybody knows each other, and it's quite small, that's why it's called a small village. But when you feel out of place, or feel that you don't belong there, I think it's not the most fun time. So I've been bullied my entire life while living in that village. I know how it is to be alone. Who remembers this one? <laughs> this is my first computer. It's a 486, 8 megabytes of RAM. This was awesome. And you know why? Because it didn't judge me. Because it didn't think I was a smart ass. Thought that I shouldn't be there. Computers don't judge. And I don't think we should either. I think we can learn a little bit from this. I mean, if a computer makes a mistake, it's because of we did it, not because it doesn't like us. So now it's 2016, and I've managed to find my way out, work at a great communication agency. I think it's time for me to stand up and try to make a change for a more diverse industry, because I mean, we almost have self-driving cars, and we can p put people on the moon. But somehow we can make an industry that's welcoming for everyone. I think that's insane. So let's try to see how we can change that. So before we continue, let's have a look at what diversity is. I mentioned gender already, but diversity is so much more. So let's have a look. Well, I'm male. And I'm a woman, as you might see. And I'm 31 years old. That slide went too fast. <laughs> <laughs> I celebrated my 27th birthday for the 17th time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm white. So am I. I'm Caucasian. And I'm from Jewish descent. I'm agnostic. I would call myself a humanist, spiritual humanist. Let's put it that way. Well, I'm slim built. Back in the days, they used to call me the living corpse. I'm glad he's still alive. But as you might see, I'm a bit more curvy. I suffer from depression. I'm hypersensitive. I'm a heterosexual. Let's just say I like uh, people and leave it at that. I grew up in a small village, and now I live in a town. 
I grew up in a one-parent family in a village, and I live in Amsterdam. Well, this is the first talk that I've been giving at several occasions. And uh, as probably nobody here knows, but uh, I'm quite an experienced speaker, and, and if you come to other conferences, you might see me again. Well, and I'm ex employed at a communication agency. And I'm self-employed. We, we are, are developers. developers. We love we diversity. Diverse. The whole thing about diversity is we're all different in so many different ways. It's not about being equal. It is about treating each other as equals. Does that make sense? We're not the same, but we are colleagues. We are fellow developers. So let's treat each other as equals, as your colleague. And then you might say, but yeah, but why the hell would we bother? I mean, what's in it for me? Why do I care? Why should I care about diversity? Well, let's have a quick look at quality. Do we all like to have quality in our work? Okay, well, one of the things we do as programmers, as developers, is we think in scenarios every single day. We think, how will our user want to use our application or build onto our applications? We think how that Russian hacker will try to hack it. We think about uh, the ways people might want to build a platform onto a, our application. We try to create, think in scenarios and try to make our application suitable for all. The more scenarios we can come up with, the better the quality of our products will be. And the more diverse people you have in your team, the better the scenarios will be. And that isn't even necessarily the uh, people from underrepresented groups who will bring in the new scenarios, but just for the fact that they're in the team, the whole team will come up with better and more diverse scenarios. Therefore, we, we would create better software. Quality, simple, solu uh, simple equation. It will be, uh, be better if you have a more diverse team. So, I don't know if you know these ones, but these are the emojis and they're uh, sent out by the uh, ASCII Foundation and Apple implemented them as first and they've been expanded with, uh, with different skin tones. And I think those, those small things, those are the changes that add up and make our software a little bit better every time. I mean, if we just think a little step further, that will make the change. And uh, some of you might know I'm a vegetarian. Well, every time I go to a restaurant website, <coughs> I want to sign up for that, and I have to make in the notes, I have to tell them, like, hey, I'm a vegetarian. It feels like some kind of excuse. It feels like, oh, I have to tell them, and I have to... This one, it's the same amount of work to make. And it makes me feel more welcome, because that one makes me feel like, ah, I can be there. And also, when we make a form for in our application for gender, I don't think this is sufficient anymore. And it completely complies on your target audience, but this is better, or maybe the right one. And if you look at Facebook, they currently have 71 options for gender. And that doesn't say that you have to implement 71 options for gender. If you think about your target audience and what you can do about it, make people feel welcome. It's yeah. those small things that add up. I think we, can all, we all know by now that gender isn't binary, so let's not treat it like that. And if we think a little bit further, a little bit more creative, I think we can make some great solutions for that. Yeah. This was a company who tried to think out of the box, and uh, this is what they came up with. Next one. Another reason to do diversity and find it important, economy. If we look at different research reports, I mean, the, the figures are different depending on which report you look at, but the projected growth for the industry is about 25%. That's already including offshoring to low-wage uh, low countries, where those countries will grow as well in their economy. But that's excluding disruptive growth. And what is it we've seen in the IT industry in the last 10 years, in the last 20 years? 
all we've seen is disruptive growth. Disruptive growth because of the, the, com, uh, the, the rise of the internet. Disruptive growth uh, because of our, uh, ERP. Disruptive growth because of the, uh, the massive rise of uh, mobile users. If we get yet another round of disruptive growth, the chances that our industry needs to grow to meet demand to 250% of what it is now are very, very real. If we look at workforce numbers, the, this industry has the highest numbers of vacancies and the lowest number of people available at this moment to fill it. We literally have a problem here. But that problem would be a lot less if we don't ignore 60% of the potential workforce. And if you then add that up to success, again, we come with the econom uh, economic uh, measurements, it has been found that every single company where both at board level as well as at the, the work field levels, there's a more diverse workforce, is more successful. They have more customers, they have uh, uh, higher growth in profits, they have higher uh, um, uh, turnover, uh, all the debt equity ratios are better, it's literally every single research which looks into these things finds that diversity is the winning proposition. Your company will have more success because of it. So why not? Why are we still holding back? Why is this still largely a white male industry? So uh, Spotify did an experiment that they called the hackathon and they're doing that often but they did a diversity hackathon in which they aimed for a 50-50% ratio for gender. And they were thinking about that, like how are we going to proposition that if we want to have a 50-50% industry. Hmm, hmm, hmm. And they managed to, just by doing the marketing different and by doing the uh, aim for the, uh, for the hackathon themselves, <laughs> different, they've managed to get a 50-50% ratio just by making, for example, a playlist in before where everybody could send in and by doing marketing on Facebook, not only on GitHub, by doing tutorials on GitHub as well, by taking away the uh, competition element of the hackathon because the female gender most of the times doesn't like the competition element in a hackathon. And not just women. <laughs> So, um, and in the end, all the people that went there said, well, I think I've won the best thing ever in a hackathon. I've made some friends. So this shows that small things like changing your marketing, changing some elements, experimenting, can make a change. So, are you all convinced in case you weren't already? Do we need more diversity? Are you going to advocate for this in your companies? Have you got the information now to make the, the case to management? Yeah? Well, let's have a look at why we are here at this moment. And this is a bit of an iffy one. There's a lot of different aspects, both historical, psychological, sociological. I'm going to just highlight a few of them. It's not complete, but it will give you better understanding. And I always think, if I understand something, it's easier for me to change it, because then I know what was the reason it is how it is now. So let's quickly start with a letter Lego used to pack with their Lego products in the 70s. And one of the things it said was, literally, parents, don't decide for your children what they should play with. Let them decide for themselves. And I think that's a very valuable lesson. It's something which we've often lost in, indus uh, in this industry, but also in the whole society. Quite often, teachers will say, oh, but that's nothing for you. Maybe you should have a look at another field. Uh, people will have a value judgment about certain fields of study, fields of work, because of their unfamiliarity with it. This is a call, May let everyone become familiar with something and let them make their own judgment instead of taking the judgments from others. 
So they did something right there. I'm not saying they're still doing it right, but in the 70s they did. And if we look at the uh, computer science history, you all know the people who were meant by this tweet, by the way. Turing, yeah. Who, by the way, was not the first one to break Enigma. That was a Polish woman called Marian. And then they changed the code. Anyone know the others? Grace Hopper? Um, she isn't actually on the tweet, but definitely an important figure. Uh, Grace, uh, Grace Hopper and Sophie Wilson. Uh, we've got a list of about 20 of these figures, which are actually well-known names, names we've all heard of, except we never put it in that position, in, in, in a historical perspective. But there are quite a few very influential women in computing. So what changed? What happened that in the 80s you suddenly see this incredible drop in the interest of women going to study IT. Well, one of the things that happened is um, the sound. One of the things that happened was the rise of the personal computer. And personal computers were expensive. And if you look back at the late 70s, 80s, if you look at the family constellations, how the typical family was, if you could afford a computer, you were upper to middle, uh, middle to upper class, and most of middle to upper class families had, an, well, a task division of the wife staying at home with the kids and the husband going out to work and deciding about the money. So what personal computers were targeted at, as they were expenses, so they were marketed for rich white boys, for the people who took the decisions. And if you market something like that, then other groups get the impression this is therefore not something I should be interested in. It's discouraging. And if we then look at role models in the media, it's not much different. If we n look at what uh, CSI has done for the in-stream of students to forensic science studies, that's, it's exploded. Indiana Jones for archaeology. What role models have we got in modern media? The ones which are there are generally just comic relief. Not someone you see as a hero who you want to follow, whose footsteps you want to step into. And what about real-life role models? These are our real-life role models. How many of you can name more than one person on that slide? Can anyone name more than uh, one person? OK, I'll, I'll give you the names. These are the real-life role models at this moment, people at the top of our field, at the top of the IT industry, with diversity backgrounds, with uh, representing underrepresented uh, groups in our industry. And a lot of them, even though they are at the top of the industry, they don't speak up about their diversity background. Why not, you may ask? Why are they not the advocates we need? Well, most, li uh, most of the time, they don't, because as soon as they speak up about diversity, they're being told, yeah, but you only got the role because of being a woman because of being gay. They didn't. They actually earned these roles. They earned their uh, job. They earned a place to be at the top of their field. But there's still a perception that they're, as we would say in Dutch, excuse truces. And that's not right. So they keep quiet, except for a rare few. And then each of us brings our personal history with us. Me as a woman, when I grew up, I was always told to be wary of large groups of men. And, you know, don't cycle home alone uh, when you come back from the pub. Uh, be careful, you know, don't mind your drink, because someone could put something in it. So when I went into the IT industry, 
I kept getting confronted with large groups of men. And intuitively, literally without even thinking, my body does this. I enter a room and I step back. And then I still take those steps forward, because I know I've earned the right to be in this industry. I've earned the right to take my place. But intuitively, I do bring my personal history with me. And it's not just me as a woman, it's also people of color. This lady, this is a story from last year, she was driving through Harlem in a black BMW. And she got stopped by the police and they were asking you, uh, well, who are you and what are you doing driving through Harlem in a black BMW? Top of the range, new model. And she was like, well, this is my company car. I'm vice president of this and that bank. They did not believe her. Prejudice. They did not believe she could be the vice president of that bank. And she was like, yeah, but Obama follows me on Twitter, you know. They did not believe her. They actually locked her up in a psych ward. And it took them eight days to actually check Twitter and find out that everything she said was true. If you come across prejudice every step of the way when you're growing up, it is not strange that you're wary of meeting new people, that you're wary of groups which are seem seemingly homogeneous groups where you expect you might run into prejudice. So all of us bring those personal histories with us. And I know each of you has a personal history as well. If we have a little bit more empathy, a little bit more compassion with each other, it would already make things so much easier. <coughs> and then, even though everything I've said, people still enter the industry from in underrepresented groups. They still do. And then they leave. And they leave not because they don't like the work, not because they don't uh, like uh, the, 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 the math, the difficulty. No, they leave because of the culture. And people tell me, yeah, but we're in a merit culture. IT is a merit culture. I call bullshit. Merit can only be reasonably measured if you have objective measurements. But how should we measure merit in the IT industry? Is that the amount of commits you've made? Whether you've got merge rights? The amount of tickets you've closed? The amount of blog posts you write? What about that person who's made the translation and never claimed credit for it? What about the person who answers the support uh, phones, which is invisible if you take commit rights as a uh, credit measurement? A merit society only works if you have very, very clear objectives which are equal for everyone, but there's lots of people who quietly go about the work and don't claim the credit and are happy with that. Does that mean they're any worse than we are or any better? No, but they are part of our industry and they should be counted. Make sense? Right, and then if you look at recruiting, how often have we seen uh, recruitment advertisements like this? Seriously. If you look at recruiting in the IT industry, a lot of the advertisements are all aimed at we want the best of the best of the best, we want the top of the league. But for those top performers at the very top of the pyramid to be able to perform at their very best, we need the 90% enablers underneath that. And we're now telling those 90% enablers, you're not good enough. We don't want you. It's a, it's a good reason to leave the industry. If you don't feel valued, why would you stay? But we need them. We need them to actually become better and to have the top performers perform at the top. And then, if you, again, if we talk from recruiting and take it a little bit further, you get into language bias. And we all do that. I mean, th there's lots of expressions which are, you know, uh, man up. She's a bit over the hill. Have you got the balls to do that? Those are all expressions which have language bias in them. 
And even when you're trying not to, you can still make that mistake. And language bias is something very subtle. We, we grow up with it. Even if you're aware of it, you will still find yourself doing it. But it, it, the more you're aware you are of language bias, of the phrases we use and how they can affect other people, the better we become to avoid those phrases. So, altogether, basically the message I'm trying to, uh, bring, uh, come about to get across in this part is, if you take all that understanding, all those different perspectives, all those different things together, let's create a culture which is cooperative, which is supporting for everyone in it. Let's leave all that competitiveness, all the bullying, all the, you know, my framework is better than yours. Let's leave that outside on the marketplace. That's where you compete. But in your own team, in your own community, support each other and welcome each other. Because that's how we get better. And that's how we change the industry. Now, the next thing, the next section, we, we've looked at and, and asked enormous amount of people, what can each of us do to change this industry? How, what can every one of us do every day to make a difference? And we do not have the answer either, but we do have lots of little parts of the answer. And we're going to mention a number of them now. Please continue the conversation with us. Keep thinking about new ways to make a change every day. So, um, I don't think governments are really leading in this big change. I think they are following the masses. But if we look around at other governments, I mean, Denmark has the best laws ever for lesbians, gay, bisexuals and transgenders. And in Belgium, uh, if you're a victim of rape, the victor always has to prove his, his innocence and not the, not the one who's attacked. Um, and in the Netherlands, uh, dedicated breast pump rooms, they are mandatory. I mean, if we just look around what's already there, try to implement that and learn from that, I think that would help. Employers, how many of you are employed? Have actually a boss? Okay, so now it's a bit what you can tell your employer to do. <laughs> First of all, seriously, the fact that if I would be employed, I'd get paid 70% of what you'd get paid. Not because I'm an, any worse, no, because I'm better. But hey, I'm a woman, so we pay her less. That's got to end. Ask your colleagues w whether they are paid equally for the job they do. If their salary is significantly lower, talk with management. Say it's not acceptable. Stand up for your colleagues. Uh, another thing, I don't know about you, but quite often when companies send invites out, they say, you know, you, know, you and your wife are invited. Seriously? You and your wife? Not everyone's got a wife. You and your partner would be better. What about you plus one? Problem solved. Think about the language you use in your communication with your employees. If you're unsure, let someone from an underrepresented group read it. Just ask them for an opinion before you send it out. <laughs> so, and if we look at paternal leave in Sweden, they have great rules to that, and um, I would be happy to have it here in the Netherlands. I mean, how many of you are parents? And the thing with it is that most of the companies, they only start implementing rules for that when the first parent arrives. I mean, how many startups have never taught about parenting? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's one of the good ideas that we can also take to our employers. I love this sign. I don't know whether any of you have seen it before. But preconceptions about how people should behave, where people should be, which bathroom they should use. Make sure your environment is a welcoming one. If you know that 
in your company there's a large percentage of people who might get overexcited when they're overstimulated, make sure you have quiet rooms where they can withdraw and recharge. If you have people from different uh, religious backgrounds in your uh, company, or if you want them to come to you and work for your company, make sure you have a prayer room. What about the, the national holidays? What about the sugar f uh, uh, festival, for instance? Shouldn't we give people the choice, maybe, to have a day off on certain select other religious holidays. Make sure you create an environment in your company, both in the way it's set up, as in you know, physically, uh, make sure that there's a good disabled entrance, stuff like that, as well as in atmosphere where people feel welcome and you will see a change. So, <laughs> when I look, we already talked a little bit about language bias and when I look at vacancies it's always they're looking for the strong knights almost like if I go with a spear and a shield to my job and I don't think it's like that and I think the last time I went with a spear and a shield to my job is like kindergarten <laughs> 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 but um, the thing is that what we learned back in school it's not applying anymore I think because I've learned to say colored and right now it's black and I've learned to say handicapped and right now it's impaired. So try to update that as well and if you don't know for sure about the text that you're putting out, let somebody else read it and it's those little painful mistakes that can be that can be changed. Yeah. There were actually two initiatives I read about this week which were interesting. One is uh, someone who started oldgeekjobs.com uh, he's 37 and was already being bypassed for jobs in the IT industry because, you know, over the hill. So he started Old Geek Jobs to make sure that employers know beforehand, you know, you can get any someone from any age and uh, make it feel like an, a welcome environment uh, in a recruitment sense. A second one, which I thought was really interesting, was a company, tech company, which said, well, we, we wanted more diversity, but as soon as we started recruiting for more diversity, we realized we, we don't just have to change our vacancy uh, text, we actually need to change our whole recruitment process. Because one of the things they did was as, you know, an icebreaker, warm-up question, ask people, well, how do you like uh, uh, baseball? Or, you know, what do you think of the last baseball game? And suddenly they realized that, that did not work for anyone outside of their typical uh, recruitment in your own image target. So think about those things. So, and if we're working in an industry which is way crowded and where are a lot of vacancies and l just the least unemployment, I think we can make some rules for that. I mean, we can ask for remote jobs, we can ask for flexible work hours, and we can ask for part-time jobs. We just have to ask our employers for it. I think most of the people that I know are not the most productive between nine and five. So I think we can change that as well. If you want to recruit a more diverse group of people, cater for more diverse preferences in how people want to arrange their lives. And it, it, you will recruit better. You will get the, the people, you will attract the people you want. Right, conferences. First of all, please all give yourself an applause, you're here. <laughs> conferences are a great way to meet new people, are a great way to introduce people to the community, and are a great way to learn, of course. One of the things with conferences, though, and one of the things conferences can do, is always make sure there's a code of conduct. And I have to admit, I did not check for this conference whether they did have one. However, basically, I've been into uh, quite a few discussions with conference organizers about code of conduct, and one of them, uh, especially someone from Belgium, said, yeah, but the law in our country is stricter than any code of conduct we could come up with. And my reply to him was, yeah, but does that mean that people who don't know your law, as in, you know, people who don't live in Belgium, aren't welcome at your conference? So now they have a code of conduct. But a code of conduct shouldn't 
be just window dressing. You shouldn't have it just to have it. You actually need to act on it. Make sure there's a dedicated person who has been well announced at the starting, uh, just before the starting keynote, this is the person who goes about the code of conduct. This is the officer you can go to confidentially to say if something is going wrong. Make sure that person stays sober and is available. Everyone knows that they are there. Make sure they act on things as well. At the same time, also realize that conferences also have a social aspect. If people flirt at the drinks later in the evening, that is not a reason to throw someone out of a conference. Normal human interaction shouldn't be impaired by a code of uh, conduct. So keep a balance, keep that balance in mind when you create a code of conduct, keep that balance in mind when you are the officer to actually uh, look after it and make sure people know about it. And then what we already said, Empathy. Empathy. If, if you're not sure about how someone will perceive something, how someone will react to something. I mean, uh, we might have a great conversation later, and after that conversation, I might want to come up to you and say, you know, thanks for this. Can, can I give you a hug? I shouldn't just give that hug to you, even though I'm a hugger. I'm not sure whether you're comfortable with it. If you're unsure, ask. There's nothing wrong with asking. And it might be uncomfortable the first time you do it, but it will not be half as uncomfortable the second time you do it, let alone the third time. And you sort of avoid embarrassing situations for both sides. People will feel more welcome, more included, because you take them into consideration. You have empathy that they might feel different. Yeah? So, I don't know about you, but after a day of a conference, or halfway in the day, I meet a lot of people and I learn a lot and I see a lot and it's like... Pfft. So, if there's a room where I can just sit down and relax a little bit, oh, that would be so great. I mean, th those are the small things. Making a silent room, quite easy to do, I think, for a conference. And also, if you hand out T-shirts at your conference, make sure there are female fit shirts. I think it's cheaper <coughs> than ever <coughs> to print a few shirts and to print a lot of shirts. So having female fit shirts, having extra, 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 extra large shirts, just make people feel welcome. And the most easy thing is, when I go to a conference in a foreign country, a sign like this that says welcome in my language. So I traveled all the way to that country, and I come there and it says welcome. And it's like, ah, then I feel welcome. And it's cheap. And those are the small things that add up. And then we talk about communities. Uh, I understood there's not that many meetups and not that many local communities in uh, the Java world, is that correct? Hmm? Quite a lot? Okay. So you're all members of meetups and you all go and visit them? Do you? Good. Well, that's what we're going to be talking about now. Communities, your local communities. Because every time I go to a meetup, I get pizza and beer. Yeah. And I really <laughs> love pizza and beer. <laughs> but the third time in a week, pizza again. I mean, most of the times when you organize a meetup, it's just telling the sponsor, hey, we want to order some food over there. So it's just giving a different phone number to the sponsor and saying, hey, today we're ordering salad, we're going to try that, or tacos, or something. I mean, there's lots of kinds of food. And just experiment with that and make people feel welcome. Not everybody loves pizza. And also, there are a lot of advocacy groups out there, and they all need your help. Most of them have mentoring programs, and one day, I hope they will be all like a history thing. But they s right now, they are the ones that stand up for minority groups. Mm. It's like we're, um, a lot of them advocate, you know, the for getting more women speakers on, on stage, getting more women uh, recruited or getting people from colored uh, uh, backgrounds, people from uh, trans backgrounds. 
in the community, uh, make it easier, give out sponsorship. But it, it's like with companies where you also say we want more diversity. If you tell them you have a quota, this is what you have to meet, it's not going to work. If you give them a target, that actually works. It's just a word, different, but it does make a difference. And one day, these groups all hope not to exist anymore. At this moment, even though it's uncomfortable, even though I often feel like, you know, am I a speaker because I'm a woman? Or I know I actually know what the hell I'm talking about, but I still have this niggling of doubt. It's uncomfortable. I've decided I don't care. I'm going to stand here and show that women actually know what they're talking about technically as well as non-technically, as in this talk for a change, just to make sure that other women also see you are welcome here, you belong here. And these groups help me and others do this. Support them. Um, I've already seen some Java conferences that have a side program for kids. Awesome. Java Zone has that, I think. Java One has it. Um, I think kids are really the future of how we can make the change. Coder Dojo is one of the great examples of how you can learn kids getting familiar with code. Let them experiment with that. I mean, don't be, be, don't be biased and say, oh, it's not something for you. Be nice to them, <laughs> say good things to them. With one back. Oops, Th this one. <laughs> one thing which is this slide is supposed to convey is always encourage kids. Uh, there was a teacher in uh, Turkey and she became the head of that s secondary school. When she started, the outflow of students which went to tech universities was very low. The percentage of those which were women was even lower, it was something like 5%, which is incredibly low. And she decided, I want to change this. She then stood up, talked with all the teachers, made them all agree, we're not going to discourage people on anything, we're only going to encourage them. Just by changing that way of thinking, that way of behaving with kids, in six years' time, they made the change. About 45% of all the students who left that uh, uh, school after that went to tech universities, and nearly 50% were women. Just by encouraging instead of discouraging people. Words have a lot bigger influence than we often uh, think. Don't underestimate it. So yes, it's time to teach our kids how to do things better. And I encourage you all to do so. Please go to, even if you're not a parent, go to a Coder Dojo. And, and just be enthusiastic about what you do. That is often enough to get kids interested. Show them this is an awesome field to be in. And together we can change this industry. And then there's you. Well, you're here. One of the things I always like to, to ask people at conferences is, how many people do you know when you come into a conference? Can someone give me a ballpark figure? How many people? 20 people? What about you? 20. 20? 15? Two? Okay. If every one of us would just go up to three, maybe five new people at this conference, Introduce them to five people you already know. They will then in turn again introduce some people. Those new people who are now standing on their own, who don't know anyone, will go out of this conference and know 20 people. You, in the meantime, have gotten to know some more people, and you will know 30. And because they felt welcome, because they felt recognized, people felt seen, they will come back a lot more likely for them to come back than if you don't make them feel welcome. If they still, at the end of the conference, stand in their corner and think like, well, I learned a lot, but these people aren't very friendly. 
It's very simple. And you can do that today. And I challenge you to do so. Yeah, and so also, if you think, well, I'm quite okay and I'm not the minority and this is not my problem. We needed, obviously, to have a cat picture in this presentation, so <laughs> this is the one. You have to. But <laughs> you can always stand up for somebody else. I really encourage you to do so. But it's sometimes, you know, that you've stood up for yourself so often. You're tired of every time having to repeat the same thing or every time having to be the one to point out, hang on, we're doing it wrong. It, it's so encouraging and so supportive if someone else at some point stands up and says, hang on, but don't forget what that person said before or, or even without saying that. Remember, we need to do this differently. To feel supported, to feel heard, to feel seen is awesome. And we all need people to stand up for us. So please look around you. If you see someone who could uh, do with some of that support, be that person to stand up for them. If you think someone could stand up for you, make sure people know. So, most of the time, I'm not that good with people, but I'm a little bit shy maybe, but I'm not antisocial. You can talk to me. And I also think there are a lot of people out there that are shy or that don't like to talk that much. But if you can just go to them and uh, have a conversation with them, it can change their day. In conclusion, I think each and every one of us can contribute to changing this industry. I got the feeling that if, if we push through now, this problem will be solved within eight years. If we don't, it's going to take another 30 to 50 years. We are at a breaking point at this moment. Uh, you, can s you can sort of feel it in the air, you can see it. We're not the only one giving talks on diversity. It really is a hot topic at the moment. If you look at economy figures, we need to push through now to actually make the uh, economy figures which our industry can make. So if all of us contribute and keep thinking, keep the topic alive, we will make that change. Thank you for being here and helping us make that change. <laughs> Anyone got any questions? Any particular preference? Uh, uh, we are started. Mm -hmm. We are uh, six uh, Dutch guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we would love to have more diversity. We actually, we would love to have more colleagues. Mm -hmm. we, we don't care if they are white, brown, male, female. We are simply looking for programmers. Mm -hmm. What can we do? <laughs> <coughs> do you sponsor meetups? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. That's definitely one mm -hmm. step. Make sure your company is, uh, gets known, your name gets known. Mm -hmm. uh, do you... Th th this there's a mix of things. Basically, all, when you start recruiting, also make sure you very clearly look at the language of your vacancy. Well, since we've started doing this talk, people have been sending me vacancies like, did you see this? And one was from a typical startup. Uh, we're looking for a guy. Uh, our company, uh, we don't have a nine to five culture. In other words, if you have a family, just make, realize you're going to do 80 hour work a uh, weeks. Uh, every Friday afternoon, we have drinks into the evening. Um, I really like what about if you're a non-alcoholic? Uh, we have gaming tables. I, al like I also like the one that said, oh, we have Nerf guns. Yeah, <laughs> so, it, it, so it, it makes the company maybe sound mm -hmm. cool to a very specific group of people. Mm -hmm. In this case, guys between 20 and 25. But for the majority of people, that means that company isn't the most interesting one to work for. So very ask some people to review mm -hmm. your vacancies, review your own uh, recruitment process, review how you, uh, what other channels you can look into. So think about open sourcing software and asking people very consciously to contribute uh, and see what talent pops up. And I'm not trying to judge you, but if you say we're a company of six guys. Well, we yeah, yeah, it is. It but happened by accident. 
But you're yeah. but, you, but you can also say we're we're an anti-shift uh, company of six people, or we're. Uh, okay. I mean, I mean that mean makes it makes it more welcoming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why I'm, I am, I am yeah. it out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Have we got time for more questions? I can see the room manager behind me. Uh, okay. Any other questions? I've got two questions here. Who wants to go first? Go for it. Well, I'm, I'm going to be really, really, really nasty now. And I'm going to say, first of all, don't call them girls. <laughs> seriously, I don't feel myself being to be taken seriously if someone calls me a girl. You don't call the guys boys, do you? I don't mind, but it, it's one of those things, like, thing, ask them as well, what would you need to feel m more comfortable? Ask your whole team. Things like uh, the, the conference uh, food, the meetup food we mentioned, mm -hmm. that also goes for your company lunch. If you have catering, which is very limited, or you, you, you arrange your own catering, maybe, you know, someone might want to have salads added to that. Ask people what they would need to make the culture more mm -hmm. inclusive. I think that you already have like a little bit of a diverse uh, company. S show out what it brought your company. So might make it like like a mark, like show what the uh, what the diverse team created before and after. I think that can also uh, make other people enthusiastic. And also make like ah, oh, that's a cool company. I want to work with them because they really value who I am instead of that I just do their work. Does that help a bit? Yeah, well, I'm thinking about wording. I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can always contact us. Um, we could come to your company for an afternoon and have have a look, see if we can help in that way. Because then we can go into more depth about your particular situation, of course. But Uh, the figures are changing. The, there's actually uh, more than anything in the last two years, the numbers uh, of in-stream of underrepresented groups in studies is going up. But even then, people are still leaving. If you look at the figures of people leaving the industry, women leave the industry twice as much as men do. And that is not an in-stream problem. That's not a pipeline problem. That's a cultural problem. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, there was a, a, a samba dancing show with half naked women. Yeah. Uh, samba, I, I'm salsa dancer myself, but I'm not really out of place. Mm -hmm. it, it, it feel, to be quite fair, if I'd been there, I'd, my feeling would have been we're in a professional setting. This is a conference for professionals. What are we doing with half naked with women? Mm -hmm. Good dancer, but I felt a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. I can understand that. Yeah. Me, you're not the only uh, girl here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, and I saw it was amazing. Yeah, <laughs> and it was. You can, you can. Uh, some people will say, "Oh, it was just a show, an opening show." But when I saw their reactions on Twitter, many people were like, "Well, that's how you get." how you uh, attract developers' attention. So that, that's part of the issue. A, a lot of the times people say, you know, yeah, but it's meant as a joke. It, it's just, you know, something silly. And yes, that's true. And I'm still in this industry after 20 years. So yes, I can put up with those things. At the same time, it adds up. It, it's not just the one joke. It's not just the one silly thing. It's that one thing a day 
which wears you down, which makes you want to leave the industry, which just makes you feel uncomfortable. It's having to put up with things like this all the time. But how do you create awareness? Because I know... But well, have you told the organization? Yeah, uh, well, they are mm -hmm. tagged in all their <laughs> messages. But I know the NL Yoga is trying to get more the diversity. They have a woman in the program committee. Yeah. They want more female speakers. So, so I know they are trying, but then they do something like this. So I think they are not really aware of the fact what they're actually portraying mm. to other yeah. people, how they, how it comes across. Mm -hmm. yeah. So well, how do you actually create awareness for, for those kind of By things? definitely speaking up, by you're mm -hmm. asking the question, it's videotaped, people are going to see this. Okay. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> Secondly, actually, I'm, uh, now I know about this, I will go to the organization and I will talk about this with mm -hmm. them. And, most and most I expect other people to do so as well. Yeah, most conferences have like this evaluation or feedback forms as well at the end of the conference. Please step up for each other. Yeah. We will be around for a little bit longer, so please find us. But I think we need to clear the room for the next speaker. Thank you for being here. Thank you for staying for the Q&A. <laughs>